Um, let's see, I put it this way, the greatest jazz drummer that's ever lived. I had uh, sat in with him for one tune at Pookie's Pub, which was a club catty corner down the other end of the block uh, from the old half note. And I doubt if he would remember me, would have remembered me, maybe he would have, I don't know. <clears throat> and then I was in Boston playing a gig and I was at the school and I happened to have my electric bass and a phone call came in from WGBH TV that what had happened was Jimmy Garrison went to New York to take care of something and he missed the plane coming back and they were doing a half hour TV, live TV show and they needed a bass player. So I flew out there, tried to get the bass together in about the 15 minutes we had before the thing went live. I didn't know what we were playing. I went back and I got a copy of that recording. I still have a copy of it. And you can hear me veer off here and there mostly because I didn't know maybe about the form or I didn't know the chords. Uh, but what I think got through to Elvin was that my beat fit with what I was doing on the electric bass. And it was a few months later, and I guess he remembered, because out of the blue, he called me. It was a trio with Joe Farrell, yep. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to Elvin Jones and uh, the incredible band that uh, you were part of with Dave Liebman and Steve Grossman in a moment. But Bobby, I want to go back to... Uh, this poster. When I joined Elvin, it was a two saxophone quartet with Joe Farrell and Frank Foster. And um, I had been doing a lot of jam sessions with David Liebman uh, and even a lot more sessions with Steve Grossman. And I felt that these fellows, um, especially because of the Cold Train influence, that uh, he had on them and the way they played would the the music would if they were in the band with Elvin would be closer to Coltrane than what the music was with Joe and Frank not to take anything away from both of them uh, both great musicians but in terms of the style and uh, the type of music uh, so I <clears throat> uh, was uh, instrumental in uh, having Elvin <clears throat> uh, try out Dave Liebman. And he came and played with us at Slugs one night late on the third set. And Elvin liked him and hired him on the spot. So now we have three tenor saxophonists. <laughs> well, Lieb would play some uh, soprano and flute. Um, and then Frank, uh, excuse me, uh, then uh, Joe Farrell decided to leave. And uh, so we're floating along with Frank and, uh, and uh, David. And I kept speaking with Elvin about this young man, Steve Grossman, that should consider, you know, listening to him. And so eventually it came to pass. Steve came, played, Elvin loved him, hired him. And Frank left the band. So that's how that quartet came together. And we were together for over a year. And then Miles Davis came and to the Vanguard, Village Vanguard, one night. And uh, uh, essentially took Dave from Elvin's band uh, with uh, Elvin's blessing. In fact, I believe the words that... Uh, Elvin said to Liebman, when this thing came up, he said, when Miles Davis calls, you got to go. So uh, he did. And Azar Lawrence came in, along with Steve Grossman. And then I split the group. And what happened after that, I don't know. But I would play with Elvin from time to time. Uh, we had Yoshiaki Masuo on guitar, Ryo Kawasaki on guitar. There was another guitarist. His name is not coming to me now. Pat LaBarbera was there then. I played with him. Um, you know, pickup gigs. I wasn't full time anymore. Yeah. And then the very, the very last time I played with him was at the Blue Note. Uh, and that was with uh, Mike Brecker and... Um, uh, uh, Darren Barrett on trumpet. 
Uh, I can't remember the piano player's name, uh, and there was another saxophonist. But uh, I did a week at the Blue Note with him. That was kind of an interesting gig, just you know, kind of wrapping up the uh, avant-garde aspect. Um, it was a six night a week gig, and I think it still is for for some artists. Um, but it was back then, and so um, uh, Monday was off, so at least for us. So we started Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the first three nights, the we played two sets a night. The first set uh, was a duet. It was Elvin and Cecil Taylor. And they played the first set those first three nights. And then the rest of the nights, the quintet, I think we had a quintet or a sextet, did the other, did uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the whole thing. Well, that's, that's kind of historic. I didn't know uh, Cecil Taylor and Elvin played together, man. That must have been, that must have been incredible. Wow, blows my mind. I want to say that in, those of you who have not heard that Dave, that uh, Elvin Jones group with Dave Liebman and Gene Perla and Steve Grossman, the group was documented on a, what was then a two LP set live at the Lighthouse, uh, which I think captures some pretty incredible music. Uh, Grossman had his own thing, you know. He had chops like Coltrane, uh, so, and uh, he could really, lay those notes out there um, in a rapid fashion. Um, but he had his own sound. Uh, and in fact, on a radio interview that I did with Elvin, uh, but, uh, he states um, that uh, after John Coltrane came Steve Grossman. That's a pretty heavy recommendation. Bobby, uh, you had a relationship with Elvin. Elvin. You hung out with him. What are your memories of Elvin Jones? <laughs> well, Berkeley School of Music, you could go down to the, to the down under and hear John Coltrane Quartet. Elvin would be two feet away, you know? And uh, so I wanted to know what he was like. A lot of musicians were confused by Elvin, the drummers. They didn't think he knew where one was. You know, I mean, you know, they didn't think he knew what he was, you know, that, to me, he was like, you know, heaven on the drums. So I went up to the hotel room and introduced myself as a student at the, at the uh, Berkeley School of Music. And so he would say, well, I got to go to the post office and pick up this up. And he said, can I go with you? So I go with him to the post office. Or he wanted to go out to do this or do that. I hung around with him. And uh, these kind of people, Elvin Jones, the way he carried himself. I mean, I know he was sweet and gentle and everything, but he had that manhood thing down. And it was like uh, the way he carried myself, himself with the authority of, a, of himself as a human being. Uh, made a fantastic impression on me. And uh, to this day, I don't think I've ever heard anybody hit a cymbal with more authority than Mr. Jones. <laughs> yeah, there's some remarkable power uh, at that drum kit. Uh, I saw Elvin a number of times in person, did an interview with him once. And I was just struck by the contrast between his very intense playing and his, his gentle personality. Such a warm guy. And uh, I think that uh, that's a pretty remarkable family, uh, the Jones brothers, talking about Thad Jones and Hank Jones and Elvin. I mean, three of the finest musicians uh, who, who've played jazz and uh, on a number of historic recordings. Uh, well, the Elvin. other thing 